Just ahead on American Black Journal, a Detroit nonprofit recognizes local heroes for their community service to children, families, and seniors. Plus, legendary Detroit guitarist Billy Davis gets ready to compete on the international stage. Stay right there. American Black Journal starts now. American Black Journal is funded by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Each year, Franklin Wright Settlements in Detroit honors unsung heroes at its Spirit of Giving Awards Gala. The event recognizes these individuals for their commitment to helping children, families, and seniors achieve a better quality of life. Proceeds from the gala benefit the organization's many services and programs for young people. Joining me now is the president of Franklin Wright Settlements, Monique Marks, along with two of this year's honorees family law attorney Marianne Bruder, and Lou Harris Johnson, who has been a foster mother to more than 250 children. Welcome to American Black Journal, all three of you. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, Monique, tell us about uh, how you choose each year these sort of unsung heroes that, uh, and I think unsung is the right is the right word. These are people that you don't read about in the newspaper, see on television all the time, but they're doing really important things in our community. Well, absolutely. First of all, it's an honor to be here yet again, Stephen, yes, to talk with you. see you. <laughs> and because I love your show and it's amazing. Um, also, to sit with these two amazing women. It's not every day you find individuals that will open not just their homes, but their heart to children, especially children um, who need additional care. Yeah. Even more so than, you know, children that we have. These children come with a lot of baggage sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of barriers they have to overcome. But I've seen these women champion these children. And so you ask me how we select. Mm -hmm. It's people that come to our rescue with Franklin Wright Settlement every day and say, hey, I'll answer the call. Um, speaking of uh, Lou Johnson, mm -hmm. um, she had retired from fostering kids. She had her last batch. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and she said, you know, uh, you know, I'm getting tired. She let her license lapse. Yeah. And I convinced her to reinstate her license to take in yet another couple young ladies wow. that desperately needed a home. So we choose them by the work they do. And we, the we know because we work with them. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Marianne, being a family law attorney, I think of as one of the toughest jobs anywhere uh, because you're not just dealing with uh, the law or property or the kinds of other things that get caught up there. You're dealing with people in their lives and you are dealing with children right. uh, in their lives. Talk about your work and uh, how important it is for you to be doing it. 
Well, I think that um, <clears throat> the work is super important. I have the privilege of working um, as an independent contractor with the Michigan Children's Law Center where I represent children who are abused and neglected in Wayne County. And I have the privilege to stand next to those young people as they champion through a lot of trauma in their lives. Mm -hmm. And we're able to successfully get some of them home and sadly some of them not. But I get to watch them as they grow up. I get to represent them in court, but more importantly, I get to become their friend. And so that really is really a blessing to me. Yeah, it strikes me that, that uh, I mean, as an advocate for children in particular, you see the ways in which the law and policy and practice don't really favor kids a whole lot here in Michigan right now. I feel right. like that's a really important issue. Yeah, it's, it, it is, and it becomes very difficult, and you have to figure out how to weave through um, the disparities between the law and what it gives to children. But I've been blessed to see some amazing children do some amazing things, even though they started off really rough at the beginning. Yeah. And, and also being a foster parent myself, an adoptive mother as well, that, that adds to it as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, Lou Harris Johnson, yeah. 250 foster children. I mean, yes. that number yeah. seems overwhelming, but but of course, they aren't just numbers. These are children who come to you really because uh, it's sort of the last resort, right? I mean, they don't have other places uh, to go. So you're dealing with all kinds of challenges. I mean, 250 could easily feel like 500 or 1,000. Easily, easily, very easily. Yeah, yeah. They come with all kind of different challenges from ADH to kids just being uh, thrown out of their homes. Or I've had children given to me and their mothers couldn't uh, take care of them anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and talk about what is it that makes this work right for you? What is it that says to you, this is what I should be, should be doing? I mean, most people, even people who take in foster kids don't get to that number. This is something, this means something different to you, I guess. It, it does. When I was uh, coming up, my, I lost my parents. Um, and I lost my mother and my grandmother, and then my father couldn't take care of me because he was a... Uh, alcoholic so when I got older I said I wanted to do something for the children I didn't do anything to give back I did it to prevent them going through what I went through yeah yeah uh, Monique talk about some of the other things that you guys do at Franklin Wright Settlements I'm not sure most viewers even know what Franklin, Franklin Wright Settlements is well starting off being the oldest human service agency in the right? country we're very <laughs> proud of that but we start with early childhood education so we have a child development center and that center now educates the parents, mm -hmm. it educates the children, and all of the caregivers in that child circle so that they can grow up healthy and happy. We give them the tools necessary to make sure that they're successful in life. And then it goes through the lifespan all the way through seniors. Yeah. We have senior sen center, we have after school program tutorial services, we have um, counseling, like when a lot of the families come to us through the court system, uh, uh, it's just a lot of trauma yeah and so we have specialized counselors that deal with trauma with children and trying to get them to learn how to cope with that trauma and still be successful so we we try to be a big warm blanket for the community especially children yeah so that um, they'll, they'll become successful right uh, talk about how the work has changed uh, in the short term and in the long term I feel like things are not getting easier or better maybe they're getting a bit worse is that uh... oh absolutely um, we've seen in the last decade uh -huh. um, first of all uh, preventative services have been pulled back the funding is gone mm -hmm. so there's very few private nonprofits um, and there's a lot of agencies but they have very few resources yeah. and so I don't know what happened to the prevention dollars but they're very, very few and far between. So it, it, so the children that could have been helped at five years old, they, the help wasn't there. Um, the safety nets weren't there. And so it just exasperated the yeah. problem. And yeah. so why, now we see this kid at 14, he's dropped out of school at 12. And so we have more, um, more serious issues to deal with. Sure. And so it's changed over the time because funding has uh, shifted. And so you you know as, as I do is it's all about politics. Yeah, yeah. What's the hot button item right now? And so preventive ser to preventative services, I'm sorry, are just not there. This is not favored. Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. If we could sort of push a button and fix 
a couple of issues uh, with kids, uh, wh what would that look like? Well, I think um, really getting in there early mm -hmm. um, and getting in there really intensive. I think, unfortunately, we have a tendency to put a Band-Aid on it rather than really fix the major issues. And then the children and the families continue to struggle with the same issues for many more years before really something horrible happens. Right. And then all of a sudden we all jump in there. Yeah. And I really think that, um, you know, something that Franklin Wright Settlement does is the preventative stuff and, and just having some of that stuff on very early on is really amazing and can really help the families and strengthen the families early yeah. rather than let these children get, you know, to be 10, 11, 12 and having these issues. Yeah. Uh, strengthening families is is something that, uh, that I think we don't talk enough about. The, the idea that if you give that family support early on, you don't get to the space necessarily where you need a foster family. Uh, you, you know, that's a, that's a sort of last last resort of all of this. Right, right. And then um, unfortunately, once you need the foster family, then you have to give the services. Right. And now it's been many more years of that family in the same, doing the same thing the same way. Right. Instead of thinking about it, let's get in there early and change the ways that they're doing them. So we strengthen them. So you never need, you know, my services in terms of a foster parent or as an attorney guardian at litem for children. Right. Uh, I, I want to ask you what the same question, what could be better, what could have been done to make this easier for you to care for 250 uh, children, but, but I also want to ask what might have been done so that you might not have had to care for those 250 Maybe children. Maybe some preventional services could have been done or if the, they had the, the um, if they were able to go to Franklin Wright to get the services from them, mm -hmm. then maybe some of these children, I wouldn't wind up in my home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it's a great event. Uh, I've been there uh, at least once <laughs> yeah. uh, to see you do this, and, and the, the, the services that you guys are, are doing are just phenomenal, and it's, thank you. Uh, it's very important. So thank you for being here and sharing this with well, us. Thank you for having us, Steve. Absolutely. Up next, a Detroit musician prepares for an international blues challenge. But first, we continue our look back at the 1967 rebellion with the Detroit Historical Society's Oral History Project. Here's U.S. District Judge Avon Cohn. My first uh, direct connection was uh, late that week, I believe. I, drove, I was driving downtown to my office in the First National Building from my home on Hamilton Road in Detroit. And as I drove downtown, I remember seeing troops in the street. And I have a vague recollection of seeing an armored car or a, uh, a, uh, a tank or something. But it was the army that restored, eventually restored peace. And I don't know whether you can call it quiet uh, to the city. Uh, the riot didn't personally affect me because none of the fallout reached north of Six Mile Road, and I lived between Six and Seven Mile Road on Hamilton Road on the Detroit golf course. And all was peace and quiet in our neighborhood. Detroit guitarist Billy Davis has achieved a lot in his 63-year music career. He played with Hank Ballard and the Midnighters over a span of 30 years. He's been inducted into Cleveland's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Boston's Doo-Wop Hall of Fame, and Detroit's Rhythm and Blues Hall of Fame. Now he will get the opportunity to represent Detroit at the International Blues Challenge in Memphis next month. I see you
I'd like to welcome Billy Davis to American Black Journal, along with Laura Grimshaw, who is the co-author of his upcoming biography. Thank you both for being here. Thank you both for having us here. Yeah. So welcome back to American Black Journal, I should say, because you were just here recently talking about your music. We're always glad to, to see you and talk with you. Talk about the, this, this competition in, uh, in Memphis. Uh, what, what, what is that, uh, what's that mean to you? Well, I'm kind of excited about it because uh, the blues was my first love. I've been into rock and roll and everything else, but uh, the blues was my first love, and I'm, but I never really got into it that much. Yeah. So this is my opportunity to get into it and and go back to where I grew up at and start out. My career started in Memphis. In Tennessee. Memphis, right, yeah. right. Uh, and, and you you started out learning. Uh, music through the blues, right? Right, sure yeah. did. That was my first introduction to music to the blues. Right, and I always think that there's a strong connection between blues and good rock and roll, right? right. Uh, the, the best rock really has its roots in those those uh, progressions, in those chords uh, that are so familiar from, from blues music. Yeah, well, Muddy Waters described it exactly the way it should be. He said, the blues had a baby, and they named it Rock and Blues. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and and uh, at this competition, it's uh, it's an international competition, which yeah. I think speaks to the recognition. I mean, blues being one of the original uh, American uh, art forms, it speaks to how much it it resonates with the people around the world. Right, sure does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. His biography. <laughs> oh, his biography. Well, he's been writing his biography for five years. Yeah. Books. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I hired him to represent um, uh, my husband at an art show, uh, musically. Uh, my husband was Gary Grimshaw, okay. a famous poster artist. Yeah. And uh, since then, on, on the drive home, he started telling me about his life. And of course, I said, well, you should write a book. <laughs> and he said, well, I have been for yeah. five years. <laughs> I have been writing a book, right? <laughs> so I started out uh, as a typist, basically. And it grew from there uh, to um, a little bit of editing and yeah. then a little bit of adding. And then um, a lot of questions. We're still yeah. writing the book. Yeah. It's still unfolding as we speak. Huh. And this new phase is wonderful. Since I've been working with him on the book, he's gotten three really large awards uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. of recognition, besides being in the Hall of Fame, right. the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and the Doo-Wop and mm -hmm. the R&B Hall of Fame. He's gotten some State of Michigan recognition, mm -hmm. County of Wayne, and uh, from Luella Hannon Foundation, the 70 Over 70 Award yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, when I say 63-year music career. I mean, that's, that's uh, I think, a little overwhelming for, for some people to think that you've been at it uh, that long. Talk about that sort of time, that amount of time, uh, and how your your relationship to the music has changed over that time. I, mean, I would imagine you feel differently even about it now. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I was, uh, well, I started out really, I was ahead of my time, you know, because I was doing music that wasn't even didn't even have a name at the time. Right. <laughs> and uh, I, I played with a lot of people like, you know, Jackie Wilson, Isley Brothers, and people like that, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, now today, today is totally different, you know, the, the music business, you like you said. But uh, getting back to the blues, that, that has never changed. Yeah. And, uh, I, so that's what I, I have never experimented in and, and did any major recordings in it. Uh -huh. Like I'm uh -huh. going to do now. Like you're doing, like you're able to do now. I mean, we see in the clip there, uh, you on stage with with one of your bands, right? Uh, uh, are you writing a lot of the music yourself? I, I mean, write it all. You write it all because I have lived it. So yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I like for it to be real. Yeah, yeah. and that's, I mean, uh, in a way, that's unusual to go back to sort of what you came from after a long time. Right, see, my, my first influence it was the blues, but when I, my first big break came in rock and roll. With, with rock, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, my, my most vivid uh, image, I guess, of you is with Jackie Wilson. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that relationship. That was an, uh, an important musical relationship, right? Oh, that, that was very, very, very great, you know, because when I was started, Jackie knew, and I knew each other since we were very young. Right. And uh, he knew when I started playing guitar, he said, you learn guitar, so uh, one day you can play with play with, for me, you know. Because <laughs> even though he was a young guy, he knew what he wanted to do even then, you know. And he he, he, oh, he loved singing. 
And he knew that's what he wanted to spend the rest of his life doing. Yeah, yeah. He said, well, you learn to get tired, you, 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 <laughs> we end up doing that. Right, right. And you did that together yeah, for a right. long time. Uh, I, I think very much of his sound being about your sound in, in, in many ways. Do you feel... You feel that way? Oh yeah, because yeah. when they, see the, the, one of his biggest hits was higher and higher, right? And uh, the record company that didn't like it, they took <laughs> listen at the disc, little disc about that. Listen, at, took it through in the trash can. <laughs> he went and got it out. We came to Detroit, and uh, I called up some of the Funk Brothers, and we went and recorded at United Sound. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he could do any kind of any type of music, you know, pop, jazz, you yeah. name it, blues, rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah. So it was very, and, and he was like a like a brother to me. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how much of this story, you know, you hear him reference United Sound, very important studio here uh, in the city of Detroit. Uh, how much of his story is a Detroit story about the progression of music, the progression of culture uh, over his lifetime? Uh, well, over the lifetime, I believe it's mostly a Detroit story, mm -hmm. even though he did travel internationally with Hank for a long time. Yeah. When he, and he did uh, work in New York for a while. He worked in Memphis for a while. Um, but when he came home, he came home to Detroit. Yeah. And he started other businesses. He had a boutique for a moment, and uh, he went into uh, helping youth, mm -hmm. uh, troubled youth. Many of those young men come up to him even today and say, hey, Mr. Davis, you remember me? You know, and they're that big and <laughs> right? he doesn't remember, but he remembers. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, this is, has been his home. And uh, so the, the story, uh, uh, Billy could have been a funk brother. Mm -hmm. However, it's kind of probably better for Billy that he did that he not wasn't. end up. Yeah. A funk brother, yes. Yeah. Uh, would have been. He's not a. He can't be pigeonholed into one thing. Right. And so making him a funk brother would have kept him in one box, and I'm not sure that that. That that would have done him Billy justice, Davis. right? Yeah. 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 Um, uh, talk about. Uh, uh, talk more about what you sort of hope to do in the next few years with with this sort of rediscovery of blues. What I'm hoping to do is do. Uh, the best recording I ever did, I'm, I'm, and I want to write the greatest song ever because I feel I haven't wrote, wrote the best that I can. Yeah, yeah. So that's my goal is to write the greatest song that I ever written. Yeah. And to record it. Huh. Yeah, and and put it out on a and right. put it out on a record. Exactly. Well, we will be waiting for that. Of course, <laughs> I'm sure you will you yeah. will accomplish that. Um, uh, talk about the the musicians you're playing with, uh, too. Uh, the blues. Uh, the, it's a different group of folks than uh, than rock and roll, right? Oh yeah, to totally different. A lot of lot of the guys, because blues, blues is a feeling. You know? Right. It's, it's yeah. not how much you know and how much how you know. It's 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 you gotta feel it. If you can't feel it, you can't really. You can't do it. it you know? Yeah. But I feel it because I've had the blues for. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it. I've lived it <laughs> daily. Right. Right. Uh, but what about the uh, choosing the people? Who you're playing with, they they have to I, feel it too, right? Oh yeah, that, I have, that's why it's hard because you have to pick the right guys that you know to get it done, you know. Yeah. Because everybody can't can't feel it, you know. They, they, a lot of guys can play great, right? But they but really they don't feel, feel it. Feel right. it. Yeah. Have yeah, to tell you ahead. about Maruga this Saturday. He played with Maruga Booker, who yeah. played with uh, Hooker. Tell him about that. Huh. Yeah. Well, Maruga Booker, he was uh, John, he played with John Lee Hooker for years. Uh huh. And, uh, uh -huh. He's uh he 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 did a we just did a project called uh, Booker Plays Hooker. <laughs> there you and, go. Uh, right? And we and we playing the the, the, the music that uh John Lee Hooker made. You know, yeah. And just That's amazing. Take very special musicians to play that. Yes, it that, does. To play it right. Right, right. Because right, yeah. a lot of guys are great musicians, but they can't really feel that kind they of music. Can't feel it. All right. Well, congratulations on the, the competition in Memphis, and we will look forward to all this new. Discovery. That you Thank you so in. much. I'm going to do my best. Yeah, no, I'm sure it will be fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's our program for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks. For more information Thank about you. our guest, uh, visit AmericanBlackJournal.org. And as always, connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. Thank you. As American Black Journal looks ahead at the next 50 years, we want to hear from you, the viewers. 
Tell us what you think of this program and what you'd like to see on future episodes. Visit AmericanBlackJournal.org to take a quick survey and share your opinion. Thank you.